A lot of my work focuses on this question. How can we make digital politics more inclusive for people with disabilities? And I'm going to take it one step forward by talking about what I define as digital inclusivity, not just the inclusion. So let's um, talk about this. It's a whole problem that has new relevance, um, in part because of COVID and how important virtual participation has become you know, during the pandemic and now we're moving out of the pandemic and taking it to the next step. The friend and colleague of mine, Gerald Goggins, said that there are long-standing issues that have been given some attention in digital inclusion research. They're gender, race, class, also disability, but they often remain in the background and they lack conceptual and empirical attention that they deserve. And this issue of inclusion in digital politics, I can tell you, I've been working on in this area for a long time. So it's a bit of a Cinderella. People don't really want to engage with it for a variety of reasons that I'm going to tell you about. But for me, then, the main question becomes, are the frameworks we have to think about digital inclusion, are they suitable for us to make sure that we take up solutions that make it accessible to everyone? And the response to that are, our frameworks for now are a little, a little bit limiting, right? Very often we think about equitable access and participation in terms of digital divide, and there are different levels of divide. A first level that looks at access. Does somebody, is somebody able to access the internet? A second level that looks at usage, motivation, and skills. Do they have the skills that are needed to be able to use the internet or internet-based media? And a third level divide where we're moving toward something more interesting maybe and a bit more holistic. It's about looking at the experiences that people have with the internet and trying to interpret the outcomes of that from a variety of points of view. But all of these three approaches focus on inclusion. Inclusion is an outcome. It's something that happens that we measure after things have happened. And we don't have enough, we haven't paid enough attention to process and what happens before we measure inclusion, right? So the next question here becomes, how do we get there? How can we design more inclusive technological processes for participation, particularly with people with disabilities in politics? And when it comes to that, you know, we need to think about what contributes to inclusion or exclusion in, in the way in which technology is applied to politics. And there are three main inputs that contribute to that. One of it is technology and technological infrastructure itself. Is it available? How is it changing? How often is it changing? Does it make sure that when it's changing it takes into account every person's needs and so on? The second one is, and we know that that's not the case always, right? We know that there is still a lot of inaccessible technology that's around. Then that's where the second input comes in. Workarounds or DIY do it yourself adaptations by marginalized communities. The disability community all over the world has been very uh, smart in the way in which they've tried to come up with solutions, for example, at the time when Twitter was inaccessible and set up a separate platform to be able to make it more accessible and so on. I mean, there's a good literature about this. The third, and, and we know quite a lot about these adaptations. The third, and maybe the area where we haven't looked a lot more, and that's where the rest of the presentation is going to focus on, is the idea of our, uh, you know, our political organizations, which have a big say in how we apply technology to politics, are they paying attention to inclusivity? By inclusivity, I mean their proactive ability to be inclusive by developing meaningful and motivating opportunities for digital participation. So what are the factors? that determine whether organizations pay attention to digital inclusivity or not, and what do they mean. As I said before, many have not paid attention to this question. Why? Because traditionally political organizations have been weary of change, they like tried and tested solutions, the, the adaptation and the innovation within digital politics for large campaigns has been incremental and not you know, there haven't been big leaps, a little bit at a time. And also because tactical success has been privileged. So, whatever strategy you're setting, you know, traditionally as a campaign organization, you would think of majority publics first. The biggest number of people possible. Because your objective is winning the election. Okay, so if that makes sense, 
from a strategic perspective. But I'm going to make a reference to the US case. A lot of my research focuses on American politics. The, this is, you know, this idea that we can disregard the people who have been marginalized in politics before. It's not, it's, it's not as unimportant as it has been. It's becoming more important involving people who have been traditionally excluded because the demographics have changed. Because people who traditionally have not voted are now voting in bigger numbers and their groups are growing. You're thinking of people who are immigrants to the United States, for example, and persons with disabilities as well. So if we take disability as a case study, you will think that, you know, you need to think that there are at least 35 million disabled people in the United States who are eligible to vote. And in the last four elections, from 2016 onward, they have been voting in ever bigger numbers. There is still a gap between disabled and non-disabled people in how much they vote. They turn out at the polling station or they put in their postal uh, ballot and so on. But that's, you know, that... Um, gap is catching up. And there have been, you know, proliferation of digital disability activism in the US that has fought very important battles to protect the Affordable Care Act, for example. There have been new disability related political action committees. Political action committees is an organization that raises funds and spends them on behalf of a campaign. Uh, candidates are very interested in this PACS money because you know, it enables them to project their message further to specific groups and so on. And there are PACs, you know, political action uh, committees that revolve around all sorts of issues for many, many years. Until three or four years ago, there wasn't one that focused on disability-specific issues. Now there are at least three that do that. The same way in which there would be women's issues, political action committees, environmental issues, political action committees, and so on. So there are those groups as well. So this is a, a really a groundswell um, sort of, of support for disability issues from very many different types of organizations. Um, so far we've always focused on accessibility, but we need to look beyond that. And I will tell you why that is in a minute. So just to summarize some of the empirical or empirical um, part that I'm going to talk about now. What I did to try and um, help with the definition of inclusivity as well as trying to figure out how political campaigns are adopting digital inclusivity or not, to the extent to which they're doing it. We've done an initial study, an empiric, uh, you know, a granted theory investigation, which means we've gone off and done interviews with 20 people with disabilities who have worked in campaigns, who have worked for the Democratic National Committee, for example, and so on. Some of them at very high levels, some of them current or former members of the US Congress, and so on. Um, and we've uh, combined this aspect, right? They're members of the community, but they're also political professionals at the same time to try and learn from their experience about how these issues were talked about within organizations. And this is what we found. Well, first of all, accessibility is essential, but it's only getting us to zero. That's just the starting point. Very often, political organizations think of accessibility, digital accessibility, website accessibility, and so on, as an end point. That's not the end point for disability inclusion. That's the start point. That's you know the baseline that we need to have. And if you think about um, how far behind some political organizations have been, but now moving forward in the last few years, in 2019, there were more than 20 primary candidates for the Democratic Party's presidential primaries. Okay? Biggest field ever most diverse field ever, a lot of women, a lot of candidates of color, and so on. However, when the first debate happened in June of 2019, none of these over 20 websites for campaigns were fully accessible. None, not even one. And this is, you know, we're talking about American politics, which we think about being quite attentive to disability needs in many ways. What happened that summer is that through internal pressure from some of the people we talked to and others that work within campaigns and Twitter campaigns, you know, network of Twitter disability activists, particularly one network called hashtag Crip the Vote, which some of you may have heard of if you work in this space before, because it got quite a bit of international press, were able to put public pressure on the campaigns so that they very quickly adapted and by August when the second debate happened, 
almost everybody are brought up to speed some basic measure of accessibility. Okay? So there is this idea that digital activism can hold formal political campaigns, party campaigns, national campaigns accountable for being more accessible. But that's you know just the first step. Stopping at accessibility means you would be a failed campaign in terms of inclusive, inclusivity. For example, in 2016, the Hillary Clinton campaign was fully inclusive, right? But it didn't include any content that was specific to disability, for example. In some other cases, when they focused on specific conditions such as autism, they made information on their policy on autism only accessible through a 5,000 word PDF document. Now you can imagine that that's not very accessible to a person with a cognitive impairment or, or who's neurodiverse and so on, right? Um, and so it was slammed as pandering in some of these interviews. Um, something else that happens quite a lot in campaigns is that campaigns will think, and still think in many cases, that people with disabilities need a separate space online, separate forum, a separate chat room, a separate network to discuss their issues. And that just results in the creation of an online ghetto where you're separated from everybody else. And you're not having discussions on everything else that might relate to disability. For example, transport policy, or you know, housing policy, healthcare policy, and everything else that's going on in the other spaces. So campaigns do need to boost to be more inclusive and promote inclusivity, boost not just accessibility, but also motivation for people to become involved. You will know yourselves that having an accessible website doesn't automatically make it interesting to a person with a disability. There needs to be something for them to do on there that makes it interesting, makes it worthwhile their time, motivates them to act. So that's really where we're going with this idea of considering a person with a disability not somebody who needs to be taken care of, but somebody who's a full citizen and needs to be given the same opportunities as everybody else. Um, Finally, what I'm going to say is another measure of inclusivity is redesigning tech design processes. What does that mean? That campaign should meet people with disabilities where they are online without the birth already, without developing separate spaces, and even more so by applying what I call situational awareness. What does that mean? It's being mindful that when you make a technology decision, basic as it may be like the design of a website, um, you may be war working or directing it to a number of people with very specific circumstances. And so being aware of those circumstances and making sure that the website is valuable and accessible for all and doesn't put an undue burden on some of those people is very important. To give you an example of work I've been doing, this is something you know that you might be more or less familiar with. A lot of organizations in the U.S. use websites to collect personal stories for testimony, for inclusion in policy briefings to Congress people, and so on, for working with the media. And all of these online forms, they're a bit like a Google form where you put your information in. I mean, they're a bit more sophisticated than that. Um, they have different requirements, right? Um, you will be surprised the range of different requirements these forms include, right? So, for example, Little Lobbies is an organization that lobbies for the rights of healthcare rights of children with disabilities. They do some wonderful work, but they have a very strong kind of point because they require, for example, the submission of a photo together with somebody's story. They won't accept your submission if you don't do that. That is valuable for the organization because it gives them better content, but it also, when we look at the storyteller's experience, makes it a little bit more, uh, puts more risk on people who may be marginalized within their own community because they may be different or because they haven't shared some of their personal circumstances with people who are in their networks and so on. So there are some very basic choices to be made there when it comes to making sure that technological design results in an inclusive experience. And just to bring it all together, you know, there are three key drivers of digital inclusivity. There is pressure from dis dis digital disability activists. The rise of the disability community as a voter constituency. You know, promote uh, registration and voting among people with disabilities. The mainstreaming of disability campaign organizations. 
and I would say four principles of digital inclusivity. Making sure that inclusivity is embedded from the start, that you don't think about it when you already design your, your, your service. Meeting people with disabilities where they are, focusing on motivation, not just access and accessibility, and developing what I call situational awareness to inform technological design. Now we've had real advances here during COVID because organizations, it was the only way for them to communicate and engage with voters, right? They had to do it online. But now we're going back to business as usual and are some of those advances that we saw during the pandemic going to stay with us for the long term? That's a bit more of an open question. So that's what I would be doing.